Um, so I wanted to start off thinking about how we got here. Um, why are we endorsing candidates for ASD's board of trustees? Um, what led us to this point? Um, so back in March, the Green New Deal for Public Schools campaign of Austin DSA was voted in by our members at the general body meeting. Um, the campaign was created to join a labor-led coalition to fight for climate action in school and supporting Texas workers by creating good union jobs. The plan was to organize Austin DSA along with local unions across sectors, uh, working class families, school communities, um, and climate activists in Austin to pass a pro-worker, pro-climate bond package for the school district. As we started our organizing, our public schools were facing a deepening crisis. On the heels of teachers fighting for their safety and the safety of their students during the COVID-19 pandemic, and a wave of departures by educators uh, because of safety fears and because of worsening uh, conditions at the workplace, the majority of the district's trustees uh, were pushing for an anti-worker budget. Um, that would have that would take away break periods for teachers, um, force custodians to clean larger areas um, in the same amount of time, and other measures to basically cut costs on the back of workers. Um, so that's translated predictably into uh, worsening, more unreasonable workloads, and major burnouts. Um, educators have continued leaving in droves, and the remaining educators are left doing more work at the cost of enjoying time with their families, hobbies, resting, or, or uh, enjoying their free time how they will. Um, back to our coalition, after hearing stories from Education Austin members, um, Education Austin being the uh, educators union in Austin for ASD. Um, we heard stories in our coalition from bus drivers who had worked through holidays um, delivering meals, meals to kids. Uh, we heard from teachers who were cleaning bathrooms because custodians, um, they didn't have enough custodians and, you know, they were calling out sick. Um, we heard from a teacher who had to cover for the school nurse um, who was out sick. So um, we shifted our focus as a coalition from uh, the school bond to the worsening conditions for teachers and specifically to the board of trustees, the majority of whom uh, were, were voting against the union, against the workers and in favor of cost cutting on the backs of workers. Um, to improve the lives of educators, we need to build a majority pro-worker tr uh, trustee uh, on the ASD board. And that's why we're here. Um, Education Austin has endorsed a slate of candidates for the school board, including Andrew Gonzalez, who we'll hear from today. As we hear from Andrew and debate our endorsement, there's a few things to keep in mind. Um, any member of Austin DSA may vote. We need a quorum of 80 voting members uh, for an endorsement and a two-thirds supermajority vote will, re will result in the endorsement. Um, again, Andrew will have time to speak to members and take questions, then we'll engage in a democratic debate prior to voting. Um, again, this meeting is, uh, for those who've just joined us, this meeting is being recorded and will be shared with members um, afterwards up until the debate portion. Um, also, let's remember that an endorsement from Austin DSA is not just um, a logo on a website, as it can be with other organizations or a donation. Um, our endorsement is a commitment by our members to mobilize in support of a class struggle campaign to build power for the working class towards a better world. Um, and without further ado, I will pass it over to Andrew. Hi, thank you, Greg. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, first of all, thank you all for, for having me. I know that this meeting was called on, on very short notice, and so I appreciate everyone taking the time to, to hear me out. Um, as Greg said, my name is Andrew Gonzalez, and I'm running for the AISD Board of Trustees for District 6, which is in Central South Austin. Uh, it includes the major high school campuses or Crockett, 
Aikens, also um, Ann Richards School, and then part of the attendance zone for Travis High School. Um, I was a teacher in AISD for seven years before I you know, became a candidate for the Board of Trustees. I taught at Travis High School right on Old Torf, uh, as well as Lively Middle School, which is right on Congress, uh, formerly Fulmore Middle School. Uh, aside from being a former teacher, I'm also a graduate of entirely schools in District 6. I've lived in Austin my entire life. I went to Williams Elementary and Betacek Middle School and Aikens High School. Uh, and my mother was also a teacher uh, for 36 years in the ISD. She taught second grade bilingual and third grade education. Uh, and beyond that, my grandfather uh, on my mother's side was also a teacher. And he taught bricklaying and stonemasonry, which is different than what I taught, but it's still teaching nonetheless. And so I'm the third generation of educator in the city. Um, I planned on being a teacher my entire life. I was a very dedicated educator. I won 2020 Teacher of the Year a few years ago, which was maybe like the craziest year that you could win Teacher of the Year. It was just as the pandemic was starting. Um, but as, as Greg kind of alluded to in his introduction, I never could have imagined how difficult the conditions that not only we as teachers, but as workers all across the district would face. We've had um, a rotating cast of superintendents. We're going to be selecting our fourth superintendent in just as many school years. Each of those superintendents has brought along their own executive cabinet. Each of them has different ways of managing and different expectations for what teachers and staff are to do in the district on top of an already changing terrain that was brought to us by COVID. Um, we still have 190,000 Latinos in the city of Austin that have not been vaccinated. Uh, I had families of students that I taught during the COVID pandemic that lost family members because of uh, a lack of access to medical care. Um, our minimum wage is lower than that of ACC and lower than that of the city of Austin. And frequently, as I've talked with people across this summer, I've met bus drivers, custodians, teaching assistants, all the classified staff in our district have to work two or three jobs and live two or three towns over to be able to come to the city of Austin and take care of our children. And that is, it's tremendously unfair. In the last year, we've also lost 2,100 staff members, which is almost a fifth of the entire workforce of AISD. AISD has about 10,000 employees. And while that number alone is significant, it does not fully capture the years of experience that all of those people took with them. And so this year, we started off with about 110 vacancies. And now, at the end of September, only a few weeks into the school year, that number has increased to 377. It is almost quadruples, which tells me, as someone who trained new teachers, as a cooperating teacher supervisor for UT and Houston Tillotson, that our district is still not responding adequately to the challenges that our workers and our teachers are facing in this district. Um, as a teacher in the classroom, uh, I taught US history, but I was also integral to the design of uh, our district's first ethnic studies program. And if you're not familiar with ethnic studies, it's kind of a combination of women and gender studies, Mexican American studies, black studies, uh, Asian studies, Native American studies, kind of whatever you want it to be. And it's supposed to be reflective of your classroom. Um, I was recognized in 2018 as ally of the year by the YWCA uh, and in 2018 as teacher changemaker by Gen Generation Citizen, which is an organization that encourages civic action amongst our youth. Um, I was also a member of Education Austin, the teachers union and a campus steward. I helped to design the flexible return to work program that eventually uh, the district adopted and allowed multiple campuses to use during the COVID-19 pandemic. The reason why I'm running is because I, I think about the history of my family, what we've gone through in the city of Austin, what we've gone through in the district that we, that we know and love. And, and I cannot tell the story of my family without telling all the ways that the district has failed to meet its obligation, which is to provide a fair and appropriate education for all of our children. My, great, my grandmother attended the Zavala Mexican Industrial School, which is what it was called in the 30s, where they trained Mexican children to uh, do industrial work like sewing and bricklaying and carpentry. Uh, she left when she was in the third grade. And although she grew up in this city and lived in the city her entire life, she never learned how to read or write. And that's because when she left in third grade, no one in the district came looking for her. My own father, her son, 
also went to school in the district and he dropped out when he was a sophomore at Johnston High School, which was closed by the district in the early 2000s because he was dyslexic and the district at that time did not provide any supports to him. He was also a, a, an English language learner. Spanish was his first language. My own mother, as I said, became a bilingual teacher in this district because she was denied access to her language and even had elementary school teachers that physically punished her for using Spanish in the classroom. And that inspired her to become a bilingual educator. And now in my own life as a teacher, I see that the challenges that the district is facing and I see again and again and again how the teachers and the staff are disrespected, discounted, uh, and just abuse. And so why I'm running is to bring the perspective of a teacher who has been in this city their entire life, who's worked in education their entire life, because that perspective is so sorely missing from the board. Um, yeah, I think I'll stop there and, and I'd love to, to take any questions that you all might have for me. Thanks, Andrew. Something I... <laughs> forgot to mention is uh, we'll use progressive stack well uh, to the line for questions for Andrew, meaning you want to type stack into the chat. If you have a question, um, we may take uh, people from marginalized backgrounds uh, before you, if you are a white person or a male or cis, um, if you're on stack. So with that, uh, if you've got a question for, for Andrew, go ahead and type stack in the chat. Go ahead, Anna. Hi, my name's Anna. Um, I'm a member of Austin DSA and currently serving as our state coordinator on the leadership committee. Um, thank you so much for being here with us tonight uh, as a former Travis rebel. Um, I appreciate your work as a teacher there. Um, my question is basically, I saw in your questionnaire, you talked about charter schools and said you're for the abolition of charter schools. So I wondered if you could just speak to like, politically, how you see us being there. Thank you. Uh, it is very tough. Our state is um, pretty pro-charter uh, and creates a lot of opportunities for charters to start, you know, with very little effort in terms of uh, the application process. Uh, I, I, I do know that our state representatives uh, in the area with a few exceptions are also very anti-charter. And so the best I could say is that as this legislative session begins this January, uh, I'll continue to hold the stance that I have and to communicate the pressure that charter growth here in Austin has put on AISD. Um, since I graduated from the district, uh, we've lost about 15,000 students. Uh, despite the city gaining in population. Uh, and so there's no reason really that we should be losing all those students other than uh, the expansion of charter networks, particularly along the eastern side of the city. Um, so I, I do recognize that it's, it's, a, it's a compounding issue because as the value of the properties here in Austin increases and our student enrollment declines, uh, the way that our state school funding formula hands out, those two issues make, they, they make each other worse. Uh, they make our funding situation worse. But yeah, that's my stance on charter schools. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Ben. Uh, thank you for your thorough responses on, on our questionnaire. Um, when the current board did their hiring search for the superintendent, uh, one thing that was negotiated in that superintendent's contract, uh, I should say the former superintendent's contract, uh, was they, they uh, required that they have the ultimate hire and fire authority on staff, which is something that used to sit with our elected officials. And that was, you know, contracted or negotiated down to, to a hired executive. And I heard concerns from teachers also about their their the way their um, performance is evaluated and you know fears about that being tied to how much they're paid so what's your take or what's your perspective on like 
teacher evaluation um, and what's the best way of doing that? Sure. I guess I'll take the first point that you made and then, and then I'll get to the teacher evaluation. But the way that, uh, because we had a superintendent that left just as the COVID-19 pandemic started, um, we also had a new board that was coming into place in the fall of 2020. So the, the outgoing board voted to change the bylaws to grant the superintendent the sole authority to hire and fire anybody that was in central administration. Um, and so in this past budget cycle, in the springtime of 2020, 2022, uh, our superintendent, our outgoing superintendent, Dr. Rizalde, ex uh, exercised that power uh, by summarily cutting 600 positions from our central office um, without any type of permission from the board of trustees. Uh, that is a change. That's a relinquishment, I think, of the board's oversight power. And that's something that I think should return back to the board. It was granted to the superintendent during the COVID-19 pandemic because she was coming in. And as I said earlier, she was bringing in her entire uh, executive cabinet of her choice. Um, and that caused a, a lot of unnecessary stress on the teachers because like I said, you had a whole new approach coming from Dallas ISD, uh, people that did not know the history of the ISD uh, and yet were, were, were running the show. To your second point, uh, the evaluation system was, it, it also changed uh, unilaterally by the superintendent during the pandemic. So on top of having to adjust pedagogy having to do hybrid teaching, which was, I don't know if anybody in here was a teacher experienced that, but we had earpieces in our ears all day long. We had students that were on a laptop. We also had students that were in the classroom and we had to monitor both simultaneously. Uh, and then on top of that, we had an entirely new evaluation system. And so I'll give you an example of how unfair it is. We have a teacher from Fedez Elementary, Carrie Johnston. She's also a member of Education Austin Union member. She's being nominated. She's a finalist for Texas Teacher of the Year. And yet under our new AISD teacher evaluation system, she, would rate, she was rated as middle of the road. She got a three out of five. Um, so it's absolutely an unfair system. It's one that came from a superintendent uh, from Dallas, which I don't know if y'all know about what education reform has looked like in Dallas, but it is an entirely neoliberal approach. Uh, the TEA commissioner, Mike Marath, is the former president of the Dallas ISD Board of Trustees. And so this, this model of evaluation that's tied directly to uh, achievement on standardized test scores in the form of the STAR is one that is totally deficit oriented, totally racist and unfair to teachers. Uh, so I think that absolutely our teacher evaluation system needs to be reevaluated itself. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, next on stack, we've got Frank, followed by Andrew. Hey, uh, Andrew, thank you so much for coming. Um, I, was, I was reading over your uh, questionnaire answers, and you mentioned that you don't believe that police belong in schools. I totally agree. Um, I believe that the uh, AISD police contract comes up every year. Is that something that you would look into uh, ending and or reducing as soon as possible? I will say that that is, it's a very tough hill to climb, um, you know, just even in talking with other rank and file teachers, it's it's a very, um, I don't know how we, the, the way that people conceptualize safety in our public schools, I think it's, it's very, it's a failed model, you know? Um, there's so often times where I had students who had been through very traumatizing experiences with APD, Austin Police Department, uh, that seeing even police officers in our hallways at Travis High School was something that uh, was very triggering for them. Um, but what I, what I will add to that is that I, I don't, I think that while getting rid of police officers in our schools is a priority, I think what's even more pressing is making sure that we have a robust system of restorative justice that's ready to entirely replace that uh, very punitive system that's currently in operation across the district. Um, so I would say before eliminating or reducing AISD's police department, I would first work 
to ensure that there's tons of investment in restorative justice programming across the district. The district is working in that direction. We just signed a partnership with Life Anew. Um, it, it's a very meager investment. There are restorative justice practitioners that are assigned to groups of campuses. I would like to see one or multiple assigned to especially higher needs campuses. Uh, but but yeah, that's that's my that's where my priorities stand with regard to safety. Thanks. Um, we'll take Andrew since he was on stack and then we've got Heidi. Oh, okay. Uh, so I, so I have a question about, uh, as member, oh, uh, how would you go about supporting, uh, unions or, uh, or starting a union within the, like the board, like within the board, or how would you go about like supporting a school that might be starting a teacher's union or if there is a union already? We, we do have a, a union uh, in AISD, it's Education Austin. There are a couple of other professional organizations that uh, specifically do not call themselves union. It's Texas Classroom Teacher Association and the Association of Texas Professional Educators. Um, as I said, I was a union member the entire time that I was in the classroom. I was also a, a steward on my campus, so I was, I'm very familiar and connected to the Education Austin Executive Board um, and also familiar with how hostile sometimes campus administrators can, can be to teachers uh, whenever they're voicing concerns. What I will say is um, that I will continue to work in collaboration with Education Austin that's just who I am. Those are the people that supported me the entire time that I was in the classroom. And those are the people that I will support if and when I'm elected to the board. Uh, I will say this, it's kind of unrelated. When 2016, when Jeff Sessions was the attorney general and he announced uh, that there were not going to be any more DACA renewals, I had students in my classroom at Travis who were on DACA, who were recipients of DACA and were seniors and were trying to make decisions about their future. And the the trauma that they felt by the announcement that that program would possibly be taken away was very real. And they decided to hold a rally. They decided to march all the way down to John Cornyn's office. Uh, and Education Austin members showed up that day that our students walked out of class and they walked with us all the way down to John's Cornyn, John Cornyn's office. So that same level of commitment is what I will show to the union because that's what they showed to me and to my students. Thank you. Great. It's uh, 728. We had Q&A going to 730. Um, I think we can push that a little bit, um, but we'll close stack. And we've got questions on deck from uh, Heidi, then Tandra, then Aaron and Ramsey. Hi, Andrew. Thanks for being here. And thank you for um, going through this process with us. It's something we take really seriously. Um, and my question sort of uh, echoes what Anna was getting at earlier, um, but a little bit more generalized. I really appreciated your candidate questionnaire and your thoughtful responses, your political stances. With DSA, as I'm sure you know, we look for correct orientation, aligned orientation with our chapters, but we're also looking for folks who have the ability to organize around their agendas. And so I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about the coalition that you intend to organize to push forward on the politics that you represent within the, um, the answers that you gave on your questionnaire. Who are you looking to, to mobilize? Um, who are you looking to for leadership, et cetera? Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, I, in my conceptualization of my role as a teacher, uh, I viewed myself as an organizer. I was very fortunate enough to, when I started teaching, um, to have taken on the role of ethnic studies uh, and starting that program. And the thematic approach to that course leads to, um, agency by the end of the year. Students would take up root cause analysis of issues that they thought affected some of the populations whose histories we had learned about over the course of the school year, and then to develop a solution that would um, 
resolve that problem and to identify stakeholders, decision makers connected to the problem that they were looking at. Uh, I think that teaching that course year after year and developing that lens on myself uh, is, it's, it's unavoidable that that's also how I will approach governance on the board. Um, since I've been running, since I've been campaigning, I've made connections with, I don't know, thousands of people at this point. I've been to a number of PTAs. I've tried to organize meetings with unions on different campuses, even ones that are not schools. Uh, AISD has a warehouse that's in my district. We also have a transportation depot that's in my district. Uh, and I think that those same connections within my district and also throughout the city are what I'm going to continue to strive to, to build. It's not easy. It's taking me a really long time. I, I'm a working class person. And so just getting into all these spaces while at the same time trying to pay my bills is very difficult. Uh, but I think that's, that's just what it takes. Uh, grassroots, getting out, having conversations, talking to people about what are the problems that they're seeing in the district because I think that's what's been missing so badly from the board. I, I, the past four years, I've seen the board ask relevant questions, but then just take the line of our central administration you know, completely as truth because they're not connected to the people that are in the schools and not just the teachers, but all the other staff that I've mentioned. Um, so I, I'll say that that's what I'm gonna continue to do uh, to talking to organizations like yourselves, uh, as well as the people that are on the ground in the classrooms, uh, because there's so many challenges the district faces. The recapture formula going into this next legislative session, it has to be revised. This past year, we sent back $845 million to the state and we kept 800. So it's more than enough to fund another school district our size, but that pressure is felt unequally across our district. It's put most heavily on the Title I schools, like the ones that I worked at, because we don't have the robust PTAs to be able to make up for that, uh, you know, that difference in funding. So that's, that's just one of a number of issues that is just going to take grassroots mobilization to be able to address. Hey, Andrew, this is uh, Tandra Sheher. Um, with the rise of far right fascist school board members and west of us and north of us in these other school districts, are you prepared to hold the line against that kind of pressure? Are you prepared to protect our kids, our trans kids, our queer kids, our black and Mexican kids? Um, and I think back to what Heidi's question is, the coalition building, how are you planning on getting other members of the school board to vote the way that you want to vote? Thank you for your question. Yes, while Austin, you know, has not been as bad as some other school districts have been in Texas, we have not been immune. Last year at Doss Elementary, which is on the city's northwest side, there were videos from a pride parade that were organized on that elementary campus that ended up on libs of TikTok. And the assistant principal and the principal both received death threats out of a pride parade for elementary school students. Um, and aside from that, we've also had, you know, tiny inklings of book banning beginning to happen, particularly in Austin's Northwest side. Uh, currently we have two members or two candidates for the school board uh, that represent the views that you're describing, one of which is running for the at-large position, Heather Tulin. She is endorsed by Moms for Liberty, which is uh, one of the organizations uh, that's been funding this type of right-wing extremism on school boards across the state, but also across the country. Um, and another one is Clint Small uh, in Northwest Hills. He's, he's been connected to a lot of the anti-masking groups that emerged uh, and that filed a lawsuit against the district uh, during the early time in the COVID-19 pandemic. So I will say that there, there are strong members of our school board that are committed to workers. They are not a majority, but in this election that's coming up in about a month, there are five seats that, that are up. And in all of those five races, there are people that have direct classroom experience as I have. While no one else has the most immediate as I have, all of us have been in a classroom and all of us cultivated 
inclusive environments in the classroom that we taught in. And so I, I think that electing those five candidates uh, that have been endorsed by Education Austin, our teachers union, uh, and supporting them and making sure that I'm also not only block walking and advertising myself, but pushing for them. Uh, that's one way to ensure that our board avoids some of the pitfalls that we've seen in, in even the suburban districts that are around us. And I don't know if anybody has seen what's been going on in the Round Rock ISD school board race, but that one is a nightmare because you've got a slate of five uh, very extremist candidates that are running together. Um, there's some pretty awful transphobic billboards that are up in the northwest side of the city. Um, I, I, and if, if those fascist candidates are elected to the board, I will do everything in my power to stop any attack on expression, on gender identity, on any of the things that we've seen in the other parts of of Texas. I um, I have had to deal with my fair share of administrators in the ISD that pushed against the content that I was teaching in my ethnic studies classroom. So those are not conversations that I'm unfamiliar with. Uh, and, and it's deeply important to me. So I yeah, that's not something I'll back down on. All right, we've got a uh... We've got Ramsey and uh, then Aaron, since he was on stack prior to closing. Hi, uh, I just want to start off by think by saying uh, thank you for being here. We all appreciate that. Uh, my question is around uh, special education. Uh, you list it as one of your top priorities. Uh, and I'm really interested on in hearing what you see are the problems and the solutions. Thank you. I appreciate that question. So as I was saying, uh, or as I said earlier, when I was introducing myself, special education is deeply important to me, not only because I taught special education, I was an inclusion teacher when I taught history, uh, but also because I know the intergenerational impact of those needs not being met in the classroom. My own father is dyslexic. He dropped out of high school in AISD when he was a sophomore because the classroom that he was in was not inclusive. It was not accessible to his style of learning. Uh, and that severely limited his job opportunities. And it affected my life, um, you know, as his, as his child. So in terms of what the problems are in special education, our district commissioned a third party report last spring called the Stetson Report. It's publicly available online. They visited 12 different campuses across the city to try and uh, assess if 12 different randomly selected students were receiving the accommodations and modifications that they're legally entitled to. I think they found only in three instances were those students receiving the accommodations, modifications that are listed in their IEP uh, to guarantee that they receive a fair and appropriate education. Um, so that's a civil rights issue. If, if we're not able to provide scaffolded and modified learning for a universal and inclusive environment, um, what they identified as the problems were that our central administration does not have a cohesive, clear, communicated vision for what an inclusive classroom looks like in AISD. Two, currently we practice a lot of segregated special education, a pullout model in AISD where students who are receiving services go to a separate room to receive those uh, accommodations rather than receiving them in the general education setting. And three, it's a staffing issue. Special education is an, it's a unique certification beyond just being a standard teacher. And so if our human capital, as much as I hate that phrase, doesn't have a strategy for recruiting and retaining special education teachers, then there's no way that we're gonna be able to meet the needs of all those students. So I think each of those problems that the Stetson Report outlined uh, it's incumbent upon this next board to hold the administration accountable to address all of those issues, um, because otherwise we're going to continue to see uh, failed outcomes for our special education students. And I think this is a tough thing to say, but it's true. Like I oftentimes think that if my father, who went to school in the 70s in the ISD, who grew up in a Spanish speaking household, with a single parent and was dyslexic, 
or in AISD now in 2022, I don't know that the outcomes of his educational experience would be that much different than what he received in 1972. Uh, and that's a really sad thing, but that's, that's the state of special education. We've had I, I, like 600 students or so that are waiting evaluation. So they, we don't have enough educational diagnosticians. We've contracted out those positions because we cut them from our budget. Uh, we don't have enough certified academic language therapists. So a lot of parents are forced to pay out of pocket for their students to receive speech therapy. Um, so yeah, there's a number of problems with special education. It, it's a major issue, but those are some of the things that I would begin to work on to fix it. All right. Um, thanks, Andrew, for, uh, for speaking with us and, and taking the time to fill out the questionnaire. Um, I really enjoyed reading through it. Um, I was wondering how you see your relationship uh, with DSA, what you hope it to be. Um, for example, uh, do you see yourself like meeting with um, us regularly or consulting with comrades uh, on policy fights? Um, how do you see uh, us working together going forward? Thank you for that question. I um, I don't know if I mentioned this in my uh, questionnaire, but I was a member of the DSA Austin, uh, not a very active one because it was while I was teaching and that consumed a lot of my time. But now that I'm not, and I'm in this role where I'm, I like to conceptualize it as really like a network builder, you know, coalition builder. Uh, that is exactly the relationship that I would like to have with DSA. Um, to talk with you all when the district makes major decisions, to get your input, um, and to encourage you all to do what I've already seen you do when I was in the classroom, which is show up and support the workers in AISD. Um, I can remember specifically a rally that we had around a delayed start during the COVID-19 pandemic outside of the headquarters where there were flag waving members of the DSA there to stand in solidarity with Education Austin. Um, so I think communicating when those opportunities occur uh, and then getting your input when the district makes major decisions uh, that's, that's, I think, how I conceptualize relationship with the DSA going forward. All right. Thanks, everyone, for your questions. And thank you, Andrew, for taking the time to meet with us. Um, we will ask you to leave the meeting at this point so we can engage in our democratic debate. Um, and again, we just want to thank you so much for, for joining us, for uh, reaching out to us for our endorsement, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll be in touch. Thank you all. I appreciate you taking the time to listen.